My name is Dr. Shetesh Kapoor. I'm a professor of psychiatry at King's College London, and I'm also the dean of the Institute of Psychiatry. I'm here to talk about diagnostic tests in psychiatry. When will we have them? Uh, this is a question that patients and families often ask. Um, they go to the newspaper in the morning, and there are often um, reports of how genetic tests or imaging tests are being used to diagnose uh, psychiatric disorders. Um, if you come to a conference like the ECNP, you will see hundreds of posters and presentations talking about biological abnormalities and differences uh, in various psychiatric disorders. Yet, when you go to your psychiatrist or to your general physician looking for psychiatric help, they do not have a test that they can order either to diagnose your psychiatric illness or to make decisions about your treatment. So then the question is, uh, why, despite all these scientific successes, uh, and why, despite the continuing growth of use of technology in psychiatric research, have we still not developed psychiatric tests? And I think to answer that question, we need to go back and see how classifications in medicine have developed. So here is the very first effort at systematic classification. Uh, this is the ICD. It's called the International Classification of Causes of Sickness and Death. Uh, and if you look at its very earliest version, which was published almost 100 years ago uh, in 1900, uh, you see all the illnesses were just listed in a single list without any classification, without any segmentation, or without any reference to tests. So all of medicine started like this. But in aspects of physical medicine, things started to change. So let me take an example, for example, of congestive heart failure. Now, if about 150 years ago, you went to a doctor with congestive heart failure, uh, you would report that you had shortness of breath, and the doctor would actually observe uh, that, uh, you know, there was pedal edema, that there was swelling of your feet. That's all they had to go by. But then the stethoscope got discovered by Rappaport and Sprague, and for the very first time the doctor could listen to the heart and thereby distinguish some heart diseases from some lung diseases. Next, the chest x-ray came about. So now the doctor could see the size of your heart. Next, the EKG came around. And now the doctor could actually see the rhythm of your heart and it could even figure out whether your heart had enough blood supply or not. And then, of course, the ultrasound came along. And now the doctor could actually see precisely how much your heart was pumping and could actually even calculate the pumping efficiency of your heart. And in fact, in the last few years, there are a number of blood-based tests that have come out that actually guide the treatment. So if you go to one of these national reference testing laboratories, you find there are over 3,000 distinct clinical tests that are available, but surprisingly, uh, very few of them to diagnose a psychiatric disorder. So one might question, why has it been particularly hard in psychiatry, uh, more so than in the rest of medicine, to actually develop biological tests that your doctor can use in everyday clinical care? And I think there are several reasons for it. Um, first is that psychiatric diagnoses are made through an interview process. There is no biological gold standard. So you see, the example that I gave you in congestive heart failure, yes, tests were developed. They could always be finally compared with a post-mortem examination. So when they were first listening with a stethoscope to say a particular murmur which told them a valve was abnormal, and if two doctors could not agree, there was a final way of settling it, and that was an autopsy where you could actually go and look whether the valve was normal or not. So this has been a major challenge in psychiatry because our diagnoses are made based upon largely the patient's report and other historical considerations. Now, mind you, these diagnoses are very accurate, and by accurate, I mean reliable. So two expert, well-trained professionals uh, often agree to the range of 80 to 90 percent, which is about as good as it gets in the rest of medicine. So reliability of our diagnoses is actually not a problem. 
And in fact, if you see over the years, uh, as we go from DSM 2, 3, 4, you can see that our volumes of these manuals are getting thicker. And they're getting thicker because more and more information is being brought in about the standardization of these diagnoses. But standardization is not the same as biological validation. And therefore, one big challenge for psychiatry has been that we do not have biological ways of validating a diagnosis. And therefore, as you can imagine, it is not easy to make a test to, for a diagnosis because there is no biological gold standard by which to validate it. Now, that's not the kiss of death. You can still make progress, and we are. It's just that the progress is a little bit slower. Now, to make progress under those circumstances, what you need are tools and the abilities to study your organs of interest. And imaging has provided that. Now, imaging is relatively recent. And if you remember the example I showed you in congestive heart failure, how we successively got a stethoscope, and then we got the chest x-ray, then EKG, then ultrasound. Now, that's a journey that took 100 years. The journey in psychiatry has only just started. But I don't want to excuse psychiatry for that, because we do have had imaging for about 20 years. I think one of the reasons why it has taken a bit longer is because largely in the field, we have done very small studies. So often, to get reliable and good diagnostic tests, you need to do them in very large numbers. And a lot of our imaging efforts at the moment often have only 12 or 24 people. And often, one center does it in one way, another center does it in another way. So just to give you an example, uh, one of the most um, well-studied tests in the area of schizophrenia is a neuroimaging test of working memory. And what I have done over here is collated. Uh, and as you can see, there are over 30 studies that have studied what is wrong biologically in patients when they're doing working memory tests, uh, patients with schizophrenia, that is. And what you find is that while 30 studies have done the test, they have used very different ways of doing the test. So the average number of patients is only 12. And they've used two different types of imaging technologies. They've used four different types of working memory tests. Some of people have used a visual test, some have used a verbal test, some have used a mixed test. Some have given reward at the end of the test, some have not. So you can see, even though 750 patients have been tested, because we use slightly different techniques every time, one does not replicate the other. And in the end, while you have a lot of knowledge, you do not have a test. And I think the last reason why I believe it has been harder for us to find tests uh, in biological psychiatry is because at this point in time, a lot of our studies, and they do find differences, are between patients with psychiatric illness and perfectly healthy normal volunteers. Now, the challenge is uh, that this is not a very difficult distinction to make. It is rather easy, asking just three or five questions, to distinguish between a patient with severe schizophrenia and a perfectly normal control. So while we have found a lot of biological differences, if we made a test based on just those differences, it would tell you a patient with schizophrenia apart from a perfectly normal healthy control. But that is not really a challenge for any well-trained psychiatrist. The real challenge is, how do you distinguish a patient with schizophrenia for someone who has depression? or a patient with schizophrenia for someone who has schizotypal personality disorder. And those are the kind of tests that have not yet been done. So if we are to change things, how will we get there? Well, the first thing is we'll have to be very clear what kind of a test we are seeking. So there are various kind of tests in medicine. There are screening tests. Now, screening tests are tests which are given to almost everyone in a population. And these tests need to be very simple. They need to be highly accurate. Um, and I think it's very unlikely that in the very next decade or so, we'll have screening tests, biological screening tests, that will be given to everyone in the population.
Then there are diagnostic tests, and you see a lot of them in immunology and infectious disease, where you just send a specimen from the lab, and the lab gives you the diagnosis. So you actually do not need too much clinical information. The laboratory diagnos diagnosis is really what it is all about. Then there are monitoring tests that are used to monitor treatment. But I think that the tests that are much more likely to be relevant to psychiatry are not diagnostic tests, and we've talked about the catch-22 situation about the diagnostic test, that there is no biological gold standard. I think the tests that will work for us are tests that allow you to subtype a broad psychiatric category into smaller bits. And a good example here, and this is an example for breast cancer, is the issue of Herceptin and the HER2 tests. So breast cancer is a relatively broad diagnostic category, but if you get a breast cancer, they do a biopsy, and in their biopsy, they look for different kind of markers. And if you have a HER2 positive breast cancer, then they give you a special kind of treatment that's called Herceptin. So I could easily see how we reach a time uh, where in illnesses like depression or schizophrenia, which are rather broad categories, you would go and see your psychiatrist, they would do a test, and on the basis of the test, they won't tell you whether you have depression or not, that's something a psychiatrist can tell by doing a very careful psychiatric interview, but what I can see them telling you, look, you have the kind of depression that has a high level of BDNF, that's just one example, and this means that you need that particular treatment, or that this means that you need psychotherapy instead of medication. However, if we are going to get there, we need to rapidly expand the scope, scale, and the size of what we do. Doing studies in about 12 or 24 patients in one center are not going to get us that kind of a diagnostic test. And there are some very encouraging things that I actually see happening in terms of large-scale collaborations in psychiatry. So just to take the case of genetics, um, genetic studies uh, have been done in psychiatry now for almost over 20 years, and the sample sizes have always been small. And I show you this one recent example published in Nature Genetics, which included 21,000 patients in stage 1 and 29,000 patients in stage 2. So now you're talking about a single psychiatric study with 50,000 patients. And that's just one example. It's not just genetics. You actually get a similar example now in brain imaging, where 1,400 patients' data has been brought together to study questions in imaging. So I think if we change the scope, the scale, and the size in which we do these psychiatric studies, if we compare the relevant populations, we will very likely have a test. But the last thing I would like to point out is that just finding a reliable biological difference is not a test. And this is where the caution uh, from the Centers for Disease Contr Control and Prevention, this is one of their diagrams that I'm showing you, and as you can see, that right in the center, I've marked in the red, clinical sensitivity. That is the question that we've been talking about. Once you've figured out the clinical sensitivity, you have to look at the analytical validity. That is, can you do the test the same way in all the labs? And then, of course, you have to take it out into the clinical populations and look at the clinical utility. I think it's possible, and I'm very hopeful that in the next few years, when you'll go and see your psychiatrist, they'll probably have a test for you. And if you would like to know more details of what I've said to you, here is a paper that we have recently published in Molecular Psychiatry, and you're more than welcome to look at it. Thank you.